All right, so this is the pivot into a dream job in just 12 weeks and the secrets to identifying, finding, and landing a role that you love. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I'd be able to, there we go. Um, so you're in the right place today if you're feeling stuck in your job, if you're unemployed, if you're not sure of what you want next, uh, if you're getting sick and tired of getting rejected or ghosted by companies, or you're feeling like you're professionally falling behind, or you're just curious about what you should do next. So I'm going to go over four main problems today that uh, seem to stand in a lot of people's way. And first is the lack of clarity. Uh, second is having a lackluster brand. Third is an ineffective job search strategy. And the fourth is weak interview skills. And those combined uh, keep a lot of people from getting the jobs that they really would love. So I'm going to give you four key strategies today. One is to get crystal, crystal clear on your core whys, how to create a compelling personal brand, how to conduct an unconventional job search, and how to interview like a pro. So it all begins with clarity. Um, if you start with the end in mind, I'll let Stephen cover, you're much more likely to be able to build a bridge to where you want to go and be able to elicit the words and the phrases and uh, the imaging and, and just the messaging that you need to get out there that you'll get noticed. Uh, and then working on your network, I would say about 85% of my clients find their next role through networking. And it's usually a friend of a friend of a friend or an acquaintance of an acquaintance of an acquaintance and so forth. Uh, it is rarely job boards. And I'll show you why in a few minutes. And then um, really how to close the deal. Because now that you've got your clarity, your branding is all working, your networking machine is going, the last thing you need to do is to be able to show up and ace your interviews. So just a little bit about me before we jump in. I've worked for 10 years doing this, over the 1,000 clients. I have 30 years of startup through Fortune 500 experience. I've crossed industries at least seven times. Uh, I've a uh, founder and the CEO of C Synergy Career Coaching. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get my MBA from the Harvard Business School, and I've been a hiring manager for over two decades before I became a career coach. So some of the companies I've been fortunate enough to work with are Procter & Gamble, Technicolor, Disney, Prubeish, the U.S. government, and this is an old one, Solomon Smith Barney uh, on Wall Street. I started out, went into management consulting, and then kind of had an international, um, very eclectic career, <laughs> which actually enabled me to become a better career coach, I think. So anyway, I uh, also wrote this book called Thank God It's Wednesday. It came out a few years ago. Uh, it's on Amazon. It got on the bestseller list for, for a few days. Uh, I just want to point that out. It's in the it's in the chat room if you want to go look at that. Um, and then the other one is the uh, career, uh, I call this career mastery course. It's how to discover your career path and land a job you love in 12 weeks. And this is a course on Udemy. Uh, I put this together. It's about seven hours of 141 lessons of everything that I coach on. And if you don't want to do coaching, you might want to check this out as well. So, all right, let's get to the first problem that most people have in their job search, lack of clarity. Um, and there's, there's a reason why I went to the one size careerplanner.com and showed over 12,000 different careers. And I noticed quite a few missing. So I would say there's probably about 25,000 different careers you could choose from. So it's not uncommon to be, uh, really confused about where you want to go next. Um, and by the way, you can check this out sometime. If you drill down in any of these, it'll give you more information about each of these careers, uh, and it'll help confuse you even more. <laughs> so we help you get unconfused. Um, and the way we're going to do that is basically figure out the answers to these questions. What if I don't like it? How could I cross industries? Am I missing something? What am I truly passionate about? Um, what am I, uh, what are my best skills? What if I go down the wrong path? What else is out there? Uh, what else is out there again? I guess it's a double question. Uh, <laughs> and basically, uh, there's, it makes you feel stuck. I hear this all the time. I feel stuck. I have just too many choices. I don't know where I should use my skills and abilities next. Uh, who would need them, how to find them, all that good stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So the other problem is you're facing a whole lot of competition. It is not unusual uh, for a job uh, posting to get well in excess of 500 resumes. When I was a hiring manager, uh, first week I put a job uh, description out for a director level, I got 500 resumes. We didn't even have the ATS back then, the applicant tracking system, which is now a computer, which looks through all the resumes and cuts 95% of people. And so they never get seen by human eyes. Went through with a highlighter and literally had to go through 500 resumes. What does that tell you? Number one, there's a whole lot of competition. But number two, you have to be able to stand out, right? So um, given the fact that I had 500 resumes and a highlighter, I had two hours to do the job. You got about six seconds of consideration, right? And so if it was, if I didn't like the look of your resume, it was a no, it was just because I had so many others to look at. So you have to be aware of all these things. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. Second is a lackluster brand. 
Um, most people think that they, there's a, you just put your resume together, throw it out there, uh, do a spray and pray, put a whole bunch of resumes out there, play the numbers game, and you'll get something back. Unfortunately, a vast majority of my clients have a less than 1% rate of return on doing that strategy. Uh, you can send 500 resumes out and literally get two responses. It's horrible. Um, and the reason for that is because, well, there's ATS systems. There's 500 resumes coming in. Uh, there is a, an abundance of competition. So this is what the, this whole um, webinar is about, is how to uh, go beyond just sending a resume in. Um, and most people who do have a resume, it's, it's kind of old school. They have no narrative to it. Uh, they use a lot of fluff words. We'll talk about what those are. Uh, they're hard to read. Uh, and they use the kitchen sink approach. It's like, I'm going to throw everything in there and hopefully something sticks. Unfortunately, that is a bad strategy because you need to create a narrative and you need to show your brand and you need to have a lot of white space and those words got to um, come through right away. And so I'll show you how to do that as well. Um, another reason uh, for a lackluster brand and LinkedIn is, is prolific these days, about 750 million people on this, uh, maybe more by now, maybe close to a billion um, so you're a needle in a haystack. And if you have a profile that looks like this, it's not going to help you any. Why? Because you have an uninvited picture. Uh, this, I know Robert. He's a great guy. You wouldn't know it from his picture here. Um, but he's not smiley, right? And a lot of people have really busy backgrounds or they're wearing something casual. And so you got to have a great picture, right, to start with. And then the banner picture back here. Um, no banner picture tells me either you don't know how to use LinkedIn or you don't care. In either case, I don't care either because you don't care. So that's not good. Um, and then also you have the, the header here. You have 220 characters, about four lines. Use them to give your value proposition. This guy has no value proposition. He tells me where he worked. And that's just the default of LinkedIn. And most people never change that. And you can and you should. Uh, as you can see, he's only about 346 contacts. You got to get it up above 500 because after 500, it stops counting. It just says 500 plus, And then I know you're kind of well connected. And so that just tells me that he doesn't really care. And he's not really using LinkedIn to the maximum effect. So we'll talk about that again later as well. Um, you can't see this, but it's a week about section. It's just a rehash of experience. It says about you. So tell me about you. Give me a narrative. Uh, give me a story, three paragraphs. Tell me something interesting about you and then what those skills and abilities developed in you and why that's important to me as the reader. Um, and then his experience section was just a copy of his resume. And unfortunately, people come in here to try and um, find more about you. So if they see your resume all over again, then I'm just going to click off and go to some, some something else, to the next uh, candidate and so forth. So you want to have a really engaging LinkedIn profile. Um, the other thing is uh, we'll talk about supporting collateral. Um, this is newer stuff that you can do. Uh, most people don't have these things, a dossier, a four-tier branding statement, a mind map, a networking brief. And so all of these things are... Um, Collateral, collateral be anything you write, say, or present that expresses your value proposition in terms of the problems you can solve for other people in different forms than just your resume and LinkedIn profile. It just adds color to who you are, gives a more holistic view of who you are, and uh, gives a, a hiring manager actually more time to look at you. So um, a lot of people don't have this, and it would be a really good thing to have. And we'll talk about the strategies on how to get those things in a few minutes. So you might be a beautiful strawberry, but you look like all the other strawberries. And what we want to do is make you look different. We need you to stand out because that's going to get, get you on the yes pile. And since I'm only looking to five, high, um, interview five or 10 people, you got to be one of those five or 10 that is doing something different. So problem number three is an ineffective job search strategy. Uh, you know, some people use networking, some people use job boards, referrals, cold calls, LinkedIn, recruiters, and it's just all over the place. Uh, and you wonder, okay, which what works the best? Well, what I can tell you is job boards don't. 80% of your competition is there, um, and really only about 20% of the jobs are published. I'll tell you about the hidden job market. Um, but basically, uh, job postings will get between 300 and 500 resumes. It, it's just not uncommon. So you're doing the math there, and your odds are abysmal. Um, so you have the advertised jobs, which are the seen ones. You have the hidden job market. And here's why it's important to think like an employer, because employers do not want to go to a job board. Why? because you represent an unknown entity. So what they'll do is look internally, if they can move somebody else in here, find a temp, find a consultant, something else to put in that job. Uh, they'll contact existing staff, they'll network, they'll go to professional organizations, recruiters and so forth. And then uh, the last place they wanna look is, is that job board. So employers kind of look like this and people or candidates are looking for jobs like this. So it's opposite and which is a problem because you're probably not getting noticed because you're being like everybody else. So um, referrals are one of the best ways to get in. 
And you can literally just call people up when the company don't call HR. Why? Because they are trained to say, no, they are gatekeepers. They're trained gatekeepers. Um, and they will tell you, get in the process, get in line. We'll take a look at you. Whereas if you talk to somebody in the department that you'd be interested in, literally call them up and there are ways to find emails and, um, uh, and, and phone numbers uh, online. This is, uh, it's all like mailscoop.com and there's a whole bunch of other places. So you just have to be a, do a little sleuthing, find out who you want to talk to the target uh, companies, call them up and say, hey, yeah, five or 10 minutes at times. I, I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. You look really interesting. I'd love to hear your story because I would, would really like to work for this organization. I'd love to get your insights. And so what that does is it, it positions the person as a professional and like uh, as a guru. So they feel good about themselves. People generally like to help other people. In fact, of the thousand people I've worked with, there's only one thing they've all said in common, and that is, I want to help other people. So knowing that other people want to help you, it is not a bad idea to call them up and ask them if you're for a referral. So, you know, 40% of hires come through referrals, so you might as well go that way. Um, and unfortunately, 93% of people don't even seek this. So that means if you're a part of the 7%, you're way ahead of everybody else. You're calling people up at your target companies, ask your five or 10, 10 minutes, asking really good questions, getting the insight, and then asking, hey, would you walk my, your, my resume down to the hiring manager? Even if there's not a position available, right? Because you start to get on the radar. And then you call the person back the next month, hey, just check it in. Anything I can do for you? Uh, and is there anything new on the job board and so forth? And so you start to network into the companies that you want to work for. And Statistically, uh, companies know that if you're referred in, you're going to be a better performer. You're less likely to leave. You're easier to train. Uh, you're, you're less cost, less to hire and so forth. So there's a big reason why referrals are um, preferred over just the, the job board candidates. Um, of course, like I said, cost less time and hire, money to hire. Okay. So the other thing is weak interview skills. Um, a lot of people just can't articulate their answers very well because they haven't practiced them. They haven't thought about the three main points that they're going to say for all the different types of questions. They don't have like a, a time limit. They start to get into the context of what they did rather than the skills and abilities. And you want to stop and what I call smell the roses, point out the skills and abilities that you're using and drive down deeper into what you can do. Um, and most people don't do that. And they see it as an interrogation. Uh, the interviewer asks, you answer. They ask, you answer. They ask, you answer. And it's not a conversation. It makes them uncomfortable, makes you uncomfortable. You get nervous. They don't really like doing that. And so you want to get it into conversation. And then there's rambling. You know, all of a sudden you get nervous and you start going off. And, and so there's practice that you can do on all those things. And of course, you're always, most people have to battle nerves and anxiety because they know they're being judged and nobody likes to be judged. So, uh, you know, just getting that confidence. And so part of what I coach on is how to get that confidence into how to answer the key questions. I've done this for about 10 years and a thousand people. I've heard the best answers possible and I just kind of co combine them. So, you know, do your research or work with a coach and get all those, that good stuff. All right, so you need an interview plan. There's different types of interviews. You got phone, you got video, you got in-person, you got technical panel interviews, and they happen in different ways. And there, there are different questions that are going to be asked. There's different approaches to these things. And basically, you need to have a plan. And most people don't. So uh, they just show up and they think they're just going to suddenly be able to be a great interviewer uh, just if they went to the gym once and think they're going to be a great wit uh, in great shape, right? So you do have to practice these things uh, and really know how to approach each of the interviews. All right, so let's talk about the stuff that can help you. Um, basically, uh, the first thing you need to do is get crystal clear. Strategy number one is to figure it out um, and discover your career path because you got a lot of choices um, and it, it will make you feel you know, paralyzed if you don't start to re get really clear on what your core whys are. Um, so the first thing I say, get some performance assessment testing under your belt. I mean, it's it's great. You go to the Myers-Briggs, find out your type. It'll tell you what, what positions are uh, that might fit you and so forth. And then you can actually, there's a book. I think I have it um, in the next slide. Yeah, do what you are. It's a new version here. Uh, you can take this, just go to the library or uh, go online and you know look up the types of positions that fit your personality type. Um, there's a link for it, 16personalities.com. Uh, and then you do forward slash free dash personality dash test, and it's absolutely free. Uh, and then once you know your four letters, you can go out there and do some research and figure out what positions uh, would fit you. You can cross reference that to the Gallup Strength Finder. So it's gallup.com forward slash uh, Clifton Strengths. It'll tell you you can buy the $19 version uh, for five strengths or the, the $40, $50 version for um, 34 strengths. 
it again, just helps you articulate um, what you could bring to the table and start to see what kind of companies, uh, you know, would want those kind of things. So there's another one called Harrison Assessment Test. You go to harrisoncareerguide.com. It's a good one. I like that. It's a little more expensive than the other ones, but one of the test results that you can get is your top hundred careers that fit your personality type. You can also go to job test, brain, brainmanager.io, career explorer, ONET online, my plan, one, two, three test, the Kiersey test. And what I would look for, I do a couple of these or three or four and see what the commonalities are. What are the themes? What are the patterns that you start to see that, that are emerging? Um, and then uh, what I help people on is really figure out what they love, what they hate, what next, what they're passionate about, what they want next, and then figure out what they're yes to and what they're no to. Um, so if you work with a coach, you can do that as well. Um, or you just simply create your own little matrix and figure out what your core whys are on top up here and your values. Like, okay, what do I really value next? And think about that. And one of the ways you can get to that is just think about all the roles that you would possibly be interested in, both feasible and unfeasible or infeasible. Um, for example, I might say, I would always want to be an astronaut. And I'd say, well, why? Because it's adventure. So adventure would be one of your whys or something that has variety in it. So, so that would be a core value. Um, and then you give each of these a weighting, you know, you can weight it out to hundred uh, points, this weights hundred percent. And then you distribute these points over the different values that you have. And then you can actually take your roles and assess each of these um, uh, roles based on the different values and the different weightings. And it looks something like this. So this person uh, found out pretty clearly that they life coach and home decorator came to the top of their list when they plotted against all their core whys or core values and things that sounded really sexy and fun like baker and chef fell to the bottom. Why? Because uh, while it sounds interesting, it really just scored high on the entrepreneurial uh, segments of the why and all the other scores were kind of low. So then you start to say, well, what does a life coach or home decorator have in common? And we start to say, well, it creates worlds for other people. Um, it, it's helping other people to de determine their path and so forth. So we start to look for roles like that as well. So now you, you have an idea and you can look for ancillary roles or something that's similar in the similar vein. So um, the other thing you could do is uh, go to chat GPT. Um, and I'll just show you very quickly. So I put in what career path would fit someone with the following skills and abilities, strategic, process-oriented, implementer, so forth. And then chat GPT gave me a whole list of ideas <laughs> that I might want to consider. Uh, and then I can say, what else? And what else? And you can start to, again, to cross, um, cross examine what, what all these different tests and assessments are telling you. Um, so another great thing. And at the end, uh, what you want to do is find the, your Ikigai, which is at the center of what you love doing, what you do well, what the world needs and what you get paid well for. And you need all four of these things because you don't have all four then uh, you're either going to have a vocation or you're going to do something for charity. And it's just like, you need these things. So you got to determine what it is you love, what you do well, what the world needs and what you get paid well for. Um, how you do that? Get clear, get clear on the industries, get clear on the organizations within the industry, get clear on the roles within the organizations that fit you. And um, I work, I have this job search toolkit that I help people with. And the first thing we do is we, we eliminate image industries and we find like what industries are attractive to me, even if I've never been in them before. Part of what the strategy is, is to be able to redirect uh, people's attention off your functional knowledge and onto your um, skills and abilities. So you can cross industries. I've done it seven or eight times. Uh, and then figuring out the roles, or I'm sorry, the organizations within those industries, who, who would I want to work for? Who has the values? Um, and since COVID, uh, there is a lot more opportunity to work remotely. So now suddenly organizations across the country may be of uh, be a, a, applicable or an option for you where they weren't before. Um, and then figuring out uh, through the process of elimination and working on the other career tests and so forth, what are the roles that fit you, right? Um, and then we talk about how to build the collateral after we know all of this stuff. So if you want to conduct a laser-focused network-based job search, it is what works in this market. Uh, the spray and pray or just sending it out there doesn't. Uh, you really have to know where you want to go, starting with the end in mind, as I started in the beginning. So once we know that, we can build a bridge to it, right? We can create a compelling personal brand. And so basically, um, course two, is this is course two in the uh, Udemy uh, course that I have for Career Mastery. Uh, it tells all about branding collateral, but it's also something I coach on as well. And basically what, we, what I do is help people create next generation collateral. This is like stuff that other people aren't using and it makes you stand out. Um, like I said, Four things that these uh, that I do is a professional dossier, 
uh, a four chair branding statement, a networking brief, and a mind map. We'll go over these a little bit more uh, right now. Um, but before I do, I just want to say more than anything else, it's the words. This is as much a word play as it is anything else. Your resume, your cover letter, your networking, your interviewing, your LinkedIn profile, your next-gen collateral, all revolves around words. And so basically, we want to start building a lexicon of words and phrases that best describe you professionally from the ground up. And how do you get those? Well, you go to your assessment tests, right? You highlight those things, bring them in, and uh, think about uh, how people have described you, performance reviews, everything else. These are all sources of uh, how to describe you professionally, right? Because um, when you do that uh, in a way that is authentic and it, it matches your whys, then it's going to resonate with somebody else who also believes in the same things, has the same values. And you're going to probably find a role that fits you better within the company that really works for you. So your words are so important in this process and they are the building blocks of your brand. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Let's see. Um, so some cautions on words. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, a lot of people use these hackneyed uh, uh, words as like good communication skills, uh, fast learner, uh, track record of success, manage cross-functional teams. And we want to get really more specific uh, of uh, what this means. So give me a, an example of how you had good communication skills. Tell me how you're a fast learner. Tell me how you show your track record of success. What you want to do is basically show me and not just tell me. Unfortunately, a lot of people use these fluff words in every bit part of their uh, collateral and it just, it doesn't land. Um, so let's see more. <laughs> Works well independently, team player, results driven, hard worker. If those are on your resume, get rid of them, right? Um, talk to me more about the specifics of, of uh, what you do and, and how, how you're successful in specific accomplishments. Um, and stop using words like, uh, let's see, uh, seasoned, self-started, detail-oriented, responsible for, thinks outside the box, big picture thinker, visionary, thought leader, passionate, tra proven track record. I can tell you, having seen thousands of resumes, these words occur more often than you want, and they just make you look like everybody else. You're that beautiful strawberry that looks like everybody else. So don't use them. Uh, get more specific. Tell me how you're going to va add value and what's in it for me. So... All right, why? Why do we want this, this new collateral? One, it's gonna give you more eyeball time. Uh, you, you send me, somebody sends me a resume, they get six seconds of consideration. You send me a dossier with a good cover letter and uh, maybe a skills mind map and your resume. Suddenly I have more to look at. Um, you say, well, how do I get those things in? Well, sometimes if you're gonna apply online, first of all, I wouldn't apply online at all because networking is truly the key. I wanna get somebody to refer me and I can send them this stuff, they can walk it down. So I avoid that whole damn cattle process of and the, the system that people have to evaluate um, and basically have somebody else bring this down so I don't have to conform to some uh, website input that says you can only put your resume in your cover letter. But even if you can only put your resume cover letter in, what I would do is make your cover letter multiple parts. And then it's page two has the professional dossier, page three has your, your networking brief, whatever else like that. And so now you have a way to slip it in under the wire by just making something multiple pages. So basically it is a new approach to get the additional eyeball time and to inspire more intrigue. So what's the dossier? The dossier is a one sheet that provides a better understanding of your skills and abilities. And it basically is uh, this, uh, who am I, what I do, how I create value in my core competencies. Um, tells me something different than what's on your resume. Um, and it basically uh, projects you, know, you in the role so you know, people can see you in this. Um, it helps people better understand who you are as a person and makes, give them a holistic view of who you are. Uh, and it allows you to break into new positions because it's going to basically redirect the focus onto your skills and abilities and off of the functional knowledge or lack thereof, right? So now it's like, Okay, so you don't have 10 years that they require in the job description, uh, but I do have all the skills and abilities that the, 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 the job needs. So uh, I want to build on those things and build the relationship again. So now I'm going around the hiring process. I'm focusing on the skills and abilities. I've got additional collateral that other people don't have. So I'm starting to look different than other people. Um, the other thing is you can create a mind map. This is a graphical representation, representation of your skills and abilities. Um, and you're in the center, and then you have all of the high-level things that you do, your core competencies, and then getting into the detail of what that means. So like if you're into business development, I do negotiation, acquisitions, uh, new revenue generation. Uh, what I mean by this, I can do contracts and agreements. And if you look at this, the first thing you know that hits me is that, wow, this person knows a lot, right? And it conveys a lot because it's, it's an image. 
Um, so basically, it's like a, a menu in a restaurant. Now I get to talk about what I'm interested in as a hiring manager or interviewer. It's like, so tell me more about your cross-industry biotech experience. Um, and, and instead of you trying to pitch and pitch and pitch and throwing darts in the dark and trying to hope that something lands, you're giving them this menu and you're saying, okay, here's everything I can do. So I'm impressed with everything you can do. It's like, wow, a lot. And now I get to talk about what uh, interests me most. A um, lot of good... Uh, different tools out there that you can use for this. Um, there's free tools, there's tools you can buy for 70 bucks and so forth, but uh, giving a graphical representation of, of what your skills and abilities are is super useful because um, it demonstrates your clarity and your credibility. All right, so uh, the other thing I suggest working on is a four-tier branding statement. Well, what is that? Uh, it is the verbal aspect of your pitch. So the first two tiers are for networking. The second two tiers are for interviewing. Um, so the first might be a 15 second elevator pitch, literally in the elevator, you're talking to a CEO and you have 15 seconds to get across what you're going to say. What would you say? Um, what would you say in 60 seconds in a networking meeting and not bore people? Um, and in four senses or five senses, tell me exactly who you are, what you, what's wow about you, what you want next, and give them a call to action so that you can start to network with them to see if they know anybody who might be in their network uh, who might be able to help you. And by the way, since we all know hundreds, if not a thousand people, there's a high degree of likelihood that they know somebody who will know somebody will have your next role kind of thing. So networking is super key. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, tier three and four for interviewing. So you have phone screeners and you usually have to deal with uh, HR first. So it's more high level or you're articulate, uh, you're professional, you say who, who you say you are, you know, all these things that I'm checking the box off. And tier four is really that full blown interview where you're talking to the hiring manager and this is going for the gold kind of thing. And so you want to have that all mapped out. And what that looks like is something like this. So the first column is like, what's the value that I bring? And just thinking about, it could be all soft skills, critical thinking, relationship building, interpersonal communication, entrepreneurial perspective, strategic mindset. Um, so you want to li list out all of the things that um, are important to what your value proposition is. And then you say, well, well, here's why it's important to you, why I think it's important to you. And think this through, right? Because it's what's in it for them. That's the most important thing. And I'm going to say that a few times during this presentation is that you've got to think about what's in it for them. Um, and then what is the secret sauce? I mean, how are you doing? What are your specific skills uh, behind that? Um, so that it adds credibility because any story you tell shows me that you actually know what you're talking about. You know, otherwise it's just commentary. I'm a great project manager. Uh, I'm a great project manager because I use active listening. And the way I do that is I'm able to shut my mind off and just see things from another person's perspective and hear them and ask them really valid questions so I can get on the same side of the table as them. Way more uh, detailed than I'm a great project manager, which is just commentary. Now you're showing me how you did it. And you can actually talk to me about an example or a story when it happened at a specific company. And so um, you want to think through all of these things, um, not only for your interviews, but also for your networking, because it will help another person to really understand uh, who they might know who can help you find your next role. So as I said, again, it's what's in it for them. Everything we do is like, what are they getting? What are they getting? Instead of saying, what did I do? How did I do it? You need that, but you have to build a bridge to what they want. So you got to know what those pain points are. And again, the networking becomes a, a huge uh, part of that. Um, and, and learning the pain points and understanding what you can bring to the table. So you want to do a lot of uh, networking. So uh, how do we do that? How do we get unconventional? First of all, like I said, we, you're laser focused. We figure out the organizations, I'm sorry, the industries, the organizations and the roles, and then we get unconventional and to, to get more noticed or, or, or uh, get more attention. Um, so again, one of the things I use is the job search toolkit. Um, and, and what I look for is the the business sectors I want to go after, the companies, the possible roles, the branding components that I need, the networking contacts I need to have, the job search activity, I record that, job banks I might be on, interviews I've had, recruiters I'm talking to, job applications, and just centralize it in one place. You know, I have this tool that I offer my clients to do all that stuff and, and ways to assess all of these things. You know, So how you assess target uh, companies and what their values are and their compensation, the commute, the culture, the... the um, the benefits they have, their career path, the size, all that stuff, because you want to know all of that, th those things before you go in. You got to know whether it's a really good match. And again, most people don't do that. They see a job, they apply to it because uh, of the title, the money, and then they wind up getting it or more likely not getting it, wondering why. Um, and if they do get it, a lot of times, you know, six months, 12 months down the line, they're not happy because they haven't done this legwork uh, to know exactly what fits them. 
Um, so you really need to know the pain points, the needs, and the doubts of, of specific organizations. Uh, you got to be able to get through the ATS systems. And so basically, your interview odds are less than 1%. Again, 500 resumes come in. They want to talk to five people. Uh, it's 1%. Um, and if you want to get the job, it's 20% of that 1%. So it's really 0.2% of, of you getting a job from a job board. Whereas referrals have a 40% per chance of landing an interview, which is way better than 1%. Um, so you want to go the referral route and really work on your networking the most. Um, so what does that mean? It means there's magic in conversations. You want to talk to more people. Start with the low-hanging fruit. Talk to the people that you already know. Uh, talk to friends and family and colleagues and uh, just, just say, hey, here's what I'm looking for. And, and we'll talk about the networking brief in a second, but basically be able to elicit what your value proposition is and what you're looking for next. So conversations are able to uncover pain points, establish your credibility, establish follow-up, uh, whereas a, a piece of paper, i.e. Your, your resume and cover letter, can't do any of that, right? You send it in, you just hope, you pray. It's the spray and pray, right? You're just sitting there saying, oh man, I hope I get called back. Whereas if you're having conversations with people, you can ask them, so what are the pain points uh, that that uh, are within your department or the company right now? You know, where what are you struggling with? You know, what, what does the company want to do more of? Um, and then you work in your con your credibility with your stories and so forth. You say, yeah, I actually do that. And I did that at this company. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you schedule a follow-up. Say, hey, I'd love to talk to you more or somebody else. So all of these things, are enabled when you network, right? And I know people say, oh my God, networking is like handing out business cards. It's not, it's establishing relationships, uh, nurturing those relationships and uh, making sure that uh, people are get, hearing what you're saying. So take responsibility for what they're hearing and knowing what your value proposition and what you're looking for and what you can bring. So I mentioned the networking brief. This is a sample of one. Uh, it's great for when you go out and talk to people uh, in your network, the left side of the page talks to me about your value proposition. The right side of the page talks to me about what you're looking for next. Um, so basically, I'm going to tell them what I'm an expert at. I'm going to give them a, a, a high level view of what I do, business development, celebrity influencer relations. It doesn't give me a specific position, but it gives me a direction uh, or gives the other person a direction to think about what I do. Uh, and, and so then I say, this is how I help companies. Uh, how specifically I add value, and then my core competency. I just have a little bit of a catalog there. So they get a sense of what my value proposition. And then the right-hand side, I talk about um, my objective. Uh, old school resumes used to have that until people realize that hiring managers don't care what you want. They care what they want. Again, it's what's in it for them. But since this is a network contact, you can tell them more about what your objective is, right? You want to cast a wide net. So you're going to talk about different positions. You want to talk about different industries you're interested in. Again, because there's no job behind it, um, you're just kind of casting a, a net out there, seeing what you catch. You can say more stuff because it's, you don't have the danger of saying, oh, you don't know what you want. This way, it allows a person to, to access the database in their head and connect the dots and say, oh, I know somebody who works at this or who, it, you know, as at this company or in this position and so forth. So list your companies, your desired contacts, and have this in physical form so that you can send it. And you always want to get it introduced because you don't want to send this out to somebody without an introduction. They'll say, this is a really weird resume. Uh, so you can put networking brief across the top, or you can make it uh, landscape uh, and put right and left side on a landscape format, um, or just, just tell them what it is. Uh, that's the easiest thing. And say, hey, you know, I'd love to share my networking brief tells me, tells uh, what my value proposition is and what I'm looking for next. Would you help me with, with some ideas? Don't expect anything uh, from you to get me a job or anything. Just want to brainstorm a little bit. And nine times out of 10, people will be open to that. And by the way, they'll probably be able to give you referrals or opportunities or ideas that you might not have gotten if you didn't have this. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the job search strategy now. So the bypassing gatekeepers, those gatekeepers are the HR department, right? Um, so you want to identify the hiring managers by name at, at, if, at all possible, right? So you, you know, you want to work for this Patagonia and you want to be in the marketing department. So I'm going to go on LinkedIn. I'm going to find out who's in that marketing department. I'm going to start connecting with people. Um, and then the next thing I'm going to ask them is, hey, do you have five or 10 minutes to, yeah, for, for, for a quick chat? Because I'd love to hear your insights and opinions, how you got there. Again, making it about them, uh, letting them talk, knowing them that you're not hitting them up for a job. You can say that and not hitting you up for a job is what I'd like to get to know you a little bit more and how you got there, what you love about the company. Of course, you will ask later on in the process, just not up front. So basically, uh, you want to bypass the gatekeepers and talk to people who are actually on in the front lines and people you'd be working with and for. Um, personalizing your cover letter and resume, of course, you probably do that anyway, but making sure that whatever the job description says, 
um, you have those same words in your resume. Good uh, tip here, a little hack is to take the job description. If it's electronic, if you see one, throw it into a uh, word cloud generator. There's a bunch of them out there and see which words show up the mo most often because those are the things that are going to be most important to them. And those words need to show up in your resume in the top 30%. Why top 30% of your resume is the prime real estate, right? And you, that's going to get read. Everything down below, mm -mm. You get, remember six seconds, maybe six, 60 seconds if you're lucky. No way somebody's going to read your resume top to bottom. Uh, static, uh, statistics show that a two-page resume is two and a half times more likely to get an interview than a one-page resume. So make it two, unless you've got Boku experience, you've been in the industry for 30 years, you're going for a C-level position, then it could be like three pages or so. But really... Um, anything with five or 10 years, at least uh, minimum experience, you want to have a two page resume, you know, somebody right out of college might have one that's fine, but the one page resume is a myth. Um, and it, hiring managers just believe that you have more uh, um, uh, experience, if you have two pages. So um, personalize it, uh, top 30%, again, being really aware of what's what's in there, you can have your title and some subtitles of what you do, uh, a quick summary of what you do. Um, and your key strengths, core competencies right there. So, and a lot of white space. So I see these words, they hit me. You're more likely to get in the yes pile. Um, so you can FedEx your resume in. Uh, something that's going to bypass gatekeepers is uh, a FedEx envelope. Most people will not open somebody else's FedEx mail. It could be a contract, could be something uh, confidential and so forth. So that'll probably go right to the hiring manager. So if you know who that is and you know the address, you can send that in or just snail mail. Everybody has forgotten about snail mail. Uh, when I was back in the hiring world, when I was back in the corporate world many, many, many decades ago, um, uh, I, that's the way we used to communicate. Now nobody uses it, but it becomes a new um, option for you because nobody else is using it, right? Um, and then the other thing you do is literally drop it off at the front desk of a company if you're local. Um, you can put it in the FedEx envelope even and everything else like that, seal it up, make it look good and say, oh, you know, I just happen to be in the neighborhood and we'll drop it off, gets in the inner office mail. Person who gets it doesn't know it didn't come through FedEx because it's got an inner office mail and they, they open it. Again, it doesn't go through the uh, hiring man, uh, go through the HR department. So you can also send a personalized video. Surprisingly few people do this in the age of video technology. Everything's video, right? Uh, TikTok and, uh, you know, you see on LinkedIn, even a lot of videos showing up now. And, but people aren't sending in any personalized video and you can, it doesn't have to be long, 45 seconds. You can address the person by the name. Hey, Robert, you know, I see that you're the VP of marketing over there. And I, I would re really love to join your organization. Here's the value that I can bring, you know, 45 seconds, send that in. It's, more than likely going to get open. There's a statistic that says, I think like 89% of, of hiring managers open a video resume and look at it. Um, it's easy to produce uh, and it's a way to differentiate yourself. And all the years that I was a hiring manager, I got two videos, two videos. And I, and I know I haven't been back in the, in the corporate world for a decade, but maybe that's happening more. But I, I was just astounded that I didn't get that more. I've gotten uh, a few this way, just as a career coach, you know, just hit me up. Um, but it's it's always an innovative way to to uh, stand out and just be bold, right? Fortune favors the bold. Just go out there. You got nothing to lose because you don't have the job now. So you might as well put, put everything on the line. All right. So strategy number four, interview like a pro. 58% um, of interviewers make their decision in 15 minutes. That means the interview is over uh, probably a quarter of the way in. For most most uh, most interviews, right, and then thirty three percent make in the first ninety seconds. And I know this is true because I knew sometimes sitting down with somebody, it's like I just don't like this person. <laughs> no, they had great qualifications, so the job doesn't always go to the most uh, qualified person. It goes to the person who I think is trainable, who's got the firepower, who I like. Um, so don't be afraid to send in your resume, even to job descriptions where you fit, you know, fifty or sixty percent. Yeah, I would say maybe a minimum is fifty percent. Uh, of if you see a job description. And even if there's not a job description, uh, you want to go in and you start making uh, connections within the company so that when their job, when a job does open up, you'll be on the radar already. I've had many clients who actually cut the line. They found out a job was going to be posted in the next couple of weeks. They got the resume in, didn't in even interview anybody else. The person got the job because they were able to uh, establish those network connections and have their interview before anybody else. All right. <clears throat> Here's some other game-changing strategies. You got to know the company really well in the interviewers. Um, if you really want the job, put together a deck um, and, and send it in. Show how you can help the company. Send it to the hiring manager. Um, in the interview, have a great opening statement. Why? Because 33% of hiring managers 
make their decision the first 90 seconds. You got to have a tight two minutes, just like comics or stand up comics have a tight 10 where they got to get you laughing in the first 10 minutes. You got to convince, convince this person that you're setting the bar high, uh, that you have what they need in the first two or three minutes, right? And you can just work out, you know, your passion statements. Like, I'm passionate about this. Hit them here before here so that they say, I'm, I'm here today because I, I really love blank and here's why, right? And then you talk about why you are such a great fit for the role, why the role is such a great fit for you, and I give a summary. And you have right then a, a great opening statement. Practice it, know it inside and out. And even if they ask you a question, like, so how the opening question would be like, um, how can you add value to uh, this, uh, this company, Chuck? And uh, Chuck would say, well, you know, I, that's a great question. Before I jump into that, can I just give you a quick two minute overview of who I am? Because I think it'll really help you to um, see what I can bring to the table and I'll give context for all my other answers, right? So now you've just worked in your, uh, your opening statement, regardless of what the opening, uh, what the opening question is, uh, and you know exactly what you're going to say, which will make you feel confident. Uh, it'll set the bar high and basically, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be off to the races and, and not have to, you know, worry about what that first question is going to be. All right. So I make liberal use of stories and anecdotes. Again, these provide credibility. Anytime you talk to me about stories and anecdotes, I know that you know what you're talking about. Um, turn an interrogation into a conversation by asking questions. One of the questions I would love for you to ask in the opening is, so what pain points you're looking to solve uh, by hiring for this position? I'll say it again. What pain points are you looking to solve by hiring for this position? You'll get five different interviews, give you five different answers, and then you're going to know their perspective on what the problems are within the department or the team, whatever else like that, that that person thinks is important. And of course, that's the way you're going to answer in, in the context of. Um, and then bring a written interview presentation. So now you've got the dossier, you got the, uh, the, the great cover letter, great resume, and you're going to show up with an interview presentation, which I'll tell you more about in a second. Um, then you got to work on your presence and your confidence. That's just doing mock interviews with people. You know, as hard as it is, video yourself answering questions, see how you're showing up, see what your mannerisms are, make sure you're smiling, make sure you're succinct, uh, and, and assess yourself as if you were the hiring manager. Be able to answer the four types of interview question, the, the standard questions, the behavioral questions, situational questions, uh, the case study questions, work on all of those things. Uh, again, the interview presentation. Um, and the way you present yourself credibly and suitably is the credibility comes from what you did, your know-how, um, your experience, uh, your accomplishments. And suitability is literally, uh, do you fit the culture? Do we have the same values? Uh, are we on the same wavelength kind of thing? So even the small talk is super important. And I always say to people, the second you start the phone conversation, the second you step into the office, that interview starts, right? It doesn't start when you sit down at the interview table or when they say, okay, first question. It, everybody's evaluating you at every moment. So make sure you're remembering that. Um, and then work on how to uh, recover from botched answers. One of the best ways I can tell you how to do this is you feel you're rambling or you go down a, a rabbit hole. The first thing you can say is, uh, or the, what you could say is uh, to sum it up, <laughs> right? And then you come back to your three main points because it's going to check the person back in because uh, generally there's a, an arc of interest to any conversation. I'm interested, I'm interested, I'm not so interested, I'm really disinterested, right? So if you see the person checking out, in other words, if they're not looking at you smiling or nodding their head or looking at, at your face, they probably checked out. If they looked at your watch, they're looking at your resume, looked over your shoulder, um, those are tells. It's like in poker. Uh, there are tells that this person's thinking about something else and you need to wrap it up, right? So to sum it up, Boom. It's like, oh, I better listen again because they're going to tell me something important. Then you come back to your three or four main points and then you can really uh, recover from a bad answer by, you know, ending strong. And then uh, the other thing I help folks with, and if you, you know, uh, you, what you really want to be able to do is negotiate your compensation. Uh, you do a good job, you're going to get the offer. That offer won't be the best that, it, that you can get. I almost guarantee it. Rarely do companies give the best offers the first time too. They know there's some negotiation. If you're not willing to negotiate, they get you at a great deal. <laughs> but you want them to say, well, it's a little above our range. I want to hear that because now I know I haven't left any money on the table, right? And I can always backpedal a little bit and say, you know, I'm so excited about this business. I'm sure we can make this work. And you talk about things like a signing bonus, a performance bonus, um, uh, paid time off, um, um, RSA, stock options. There's so many different things you can work on and get a higher co uh, compensation package. So basically, don't be willing to take the, the first offer. Um, and and you'll, you'll know when they when no is a no. I, I pushed the company hard enough where they said, well, if we give you this, you could be making more than your boss. 
okay, I got that. <laughs> I'm going to stop pushing. Whereas there was another offer that came through and I kept asking for more. They just kept giving me more. I actually got points on my house because I was moving back from Europe to a US company. And I was almost embarrassed by how much they gave me uh, because I just, I asked. <laughs> so ask and know what you're, you really want and why you want those things. All right. So I talked about the interview presentation. Um, this is a great way to focus on your key strengths, uh, help you to uh, how, how, how you can help the company, make it really, really clear for them, uh, tell them what's in it for them, uh, state why you're such a great fit for the role. And, you know, you want to just, you want to be able to show them, not just tell them. So you want to do your research on the company. Uh, and it, these are different ones that my clients have all made up. You know, they're just like, here's my 30, 60, 90 day plan, or here's how I'm going to hit the ground running. Here's my interview presentation. They could have things like the yeah, 36 and 90 plan, a SWOT analysis, the strengths, weakness, opportunities, threats that you see. You could have a mind map of your skills and abilities that we talked about. Uh, some ideas, like you could do some baseline research, like, hey, here's where I see you playing in the marketplace, how I can help you. And just you know, show them that you really understand their marketplace and what the problems are. Uh, why? Because 89% of your competition is not going to do it, right? So you're going to be the, the guy or the gal um, who had who did the deck, right? So it won't get you the job, but if it's close, it's going to definitely tip the uh, scales in your favor and you'll get the offer. Um, so the benefits, it goes beyond the competition. It's bold and creative, uh, offers a broader perspective, demonstrates your skills and, and determination, and adds color to your resume. So all told, uh, if you do all of these things, you are going to have a competitive advantage in the, in the marketplace and get what you want. So I just want to talk a couple minutes on my program, and then I'm going to get into the Q&A. So if you have some questions that have come up, please put them in the chat, and we can unmute folks, and we can have uh, one-on-ones here. But basically, I want to tell you, this is the process I use. Um, so basically, first, what we do is get clear. We figure out what your key strengths are. Use some really unique uh, evaluation tools to figure out what you want, what you don't want, what you're passionate about, um, what's important to you, and that kind of stuff. And then creating that short list of targets from the industries to the organizations to the roles, and creating an actionable plan that will get you there. So then after we know that we could create the branding, we'll, we'll figure out what your unique selling proposition is. Of course, we'll work on the resume and LinkedIn profile. Uh, those are things that you have to have in this marketplace, their expectations, but you go above and beyond and you do this next generation uh, materials like the professional dossier and the mind map and uh, the 14 branding statement and so forth. And we create situational pitches based on who you're talking to and when you're talking to them. Um, finally, you know, we work on an unconventional job search uh, you know, how we're going to get in and start networking with the company, uh, the techniques, the, the, what you need to say, how you can say it, how frequently, all that good stuff. And we work on the strategy on developing contacts within the targets that you want to work for. How many targets you have? I've heard that question before. It really depends on how high up the corporate lateral you are. Obviously, somebody with uh, that's a super uh, senior, they're going to need to cast a wider net because there's just less positions uh, out there. I had one guy who was an SVP, he was tracking 179 different companies. Entry level, you might not only need to track 10 or 20 companies because there's going to be a plethora of those, those companies uh, with roles available to you. So basically, it really depends on how much you work you want to do uh, and who you know how much you think you can track um, because you want to really target specific organizations rather than just looking at job boards. Um, I work on the interview presentation with folks, figuring out what uh, we should say to stuff. And then we work on the salary negotiation as well. Um, so let's go further. What's included in the, uh, my coaching is I do professional coaching calls. It's usually a 10 session package. I have access to all the downloadable templates. Uh, I have evaluation tools, decision frameworks, scripts, uh, samples of work from hundreds of other people, uh, links to great online resources, um, and it's curated over 10 years, so there's more than you ever need. Uh, to, but basically, it's structured, it's done with you, I, you work with me, nobody else. Uh, there's 10 private one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions. Um, <clears throat> you have unlimited out-of-session support, meaning when we're not in session, just email me, call me up. It's not anything extra. We work 10 minutes, 15 minutes on something. It's not a big deal. We'll just call me up and we'll work on those things. Uh, you get referrals into my private network. I have about 20,000 connections right now. Uh, again, since I was able to go to a really nice uh, business school, most of those, my colleagues now actually own companies or even retired by now, but they can, they, they can actually uh, get you into high level connections within the, the organization. So I offer that as well as just like I lend my network to you. I will share a Google Drive for collaboration. All your work will be there. I'll see it. This way I'll be able to track you and what your progress is. 
and basically give you feedback on stuff. Um, and then you have access to monthly group coaching calls, totally free. I just put my clients together uh, and we do networking and maybe we'll put somebody on the hot seat and interview them. You see how they interview and then you have questions and answer kind of stuff. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then at the end of each of my sessions, I give the notes and the recording. So we always know what to do next. And uh, we, we're on the same track. <laughs> and finally, there's a Facebook, Facebook support group. Um, so the return on investment, just back in the envelope, if you we were to get you $5,000 extra just in this hourly negotiation, that could be $100,000 over 20 years. Or if we get you 10 extra grand, that'd be uh, 200K. It's not unusual for me to get 10 to 20 or 30, 40, thousand dollars more by basically what level you are and your job fulfillment as amex says is priceless um so is this relevant yes to people who are in corporate government nonprofit, freelancers um it works because we work on personal development it's not and and, and uh how you interface and your branding and everything else it is not specific to an industry um it is cutting edge career development strategies I do stuff that other career coaches aren't doing, uh, like you saw, uh, because it works. Uh, and I've developed the stuff over time, and I'm continuing to hone it and my trade and my craft. Um, and I, you're the beneficiary of all of that. <laughs> and then finally, um, we do the latest evaluation, presentation, branding techniques. So um, I, having been a hiring manager and work with a lot of hiring managers and so forth, I always know what to say and who to say to and that kind of stuff. And we always make sure that you are leading or not cutting edge, if not cutting edge. Um, so basically, everything is kind of soup to nuts and everything you need to land for your next position. So I want to say thank you for, for joining me. Uh, we ran right at time here at 1, 150. You got 10 minutes for um, Q&A. And I'm going to give you guys all this as a gift for joining me. It's the 10 steps to landing your perfect job. Uh, it is a checklist of all the things you want to be thinking about. Um, when you're when you're trying to find this thing, I will email it to you. I have your email, so I will just send that out to you. And, as, and uh, I just thank you for joining me today. And if you want to, uh, let's see, connect with me, here's other places you could do so. You're already probably connected with me on LinkedIn, uh, Mark uh, Langford, and then Facebook, I'm Master Career Coach. And on Twitter, which is now X, uh, I'm Career Coach Mark. Mark, I have a question. Um, I'm Vin, by the way. I'm wondering about the four questions that you ask. In your experience being on both sides, what what really are the, 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 the hypotheticals and what are the best questions from the employer's point of view that gets, that, that gives an indication to the best candidate? Yeah. Yeah, that you can ask at the end of the interview. Is that the is that what you're asking? No, me? I'm I'm curious from the interviewer's point of view. You know what, and your 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 assessment. What what really are the best questions that interviewers ask that gets them the right candidate? As as a former HR person, I would think that I think the experience base. I mean, factual interviews. What have you done, as yeah. opposed to hypotheticals or behavioral? What do you think? I agree. I think, but you want to really be able to elicit as your accomplishments, right? You'll be able to show what you accomplished and then build that bridge back to what the, the need is within the company. And the way I know that is because, again, I'm going to ask questions of my interviewer up front if I'm a good interviewer and say, so, you know, what are the pain points you're looking at yourself by hiring for the position? Um, so that I kind of know how I'm going to reference my skills and abilities and which stories and anecdotes I'm going to tell, right? And, and so, from a, an employer perspective, yeah, I want to know what you accomplished. You know, I don't want to hear the fluff answers and you know, I'm great this, I'm do this. It's like tell me and don't just show, uh, you know, show me, don't just tell me. And and so uh, I'm going to drill down if I feel like there's any um, any uh, doubt, <laughs> right? If I feel like they're snowing me or something else, like I'm going to drill that down and say, so how did you do that? What did you do? Because a lot of times, like I hear candidates say, well, we did this and we did that. It's like, so I'm, I'm thinking as a hiring manager, what did you do, right? And, and so when I look for those little red flags and I'm going to go after, I, uh, I shouldn't say go after, but I'm going to um, drill down into a candidate who I feel is, is not really, they're, they're just there because they, they want a job or something else. So I want to know what you're going to do, why you want to be here, why this, the values of companies fit you, um, why you're going to be a long-term success. Um, and if you haven't thought that through, then you're probably not my candidate, right? Um, so again, I think like with the interview presentation, if you do that, it kind of galvanizes um, or, or keeps you focused on what you're going to bring to the company. And then you actually do that research and you find more about the company, you, you put a, a deck together and so forth. 
And I, I did this personally a number of years back and I went through four interview rounds over two months. And what I did is I kept learning from the company and the people and I kept adding it back into my deck so that it actually became a small consulting gig, if you will. Yeah. By the time I interviewed the CEO, he had this deck. It was like 35 pages at this point. He lays it on the desk, full color print out. He goes, I have no doubt that you can do the job. Now I just got to see whether we're, we're a fit and whether we can afford you. So we, we kind of checked the credibility box by me doing all of this pre-work. Um, and, and if a candidate does that, I think that, you know, from a employer perspective, it's super impressive because they're going above and beyond. Totally get that. My, I have a family member that interviewed for Amazon and she was not able to make it into a conversation at all. The way they interviewed, it was like bang, 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 bang. And so she couldn't, yeah. it, there was no even time at the end to ask a question. One yeah. question she squeezed in at the end. Yeah, yeah. What do you do when, when I they're like kamikaze? I, I, I take the politician approach, right? So it's like, they ask me a question, like the news asks the politician a question. What is it? They, they deflect it, right? So what I would do, not deflect it so much, but I would piggyback my question onto it first. So I'd say, yeah, great question. Uh, before I do that and dive in, can I just ask you this, right? And then you ask your question and it gets it conversational because most people aren't trained to be interviewers. You don't go to interview training. I, I never got any in the 30 years I was in corporate. Um, and, and so it's uncomfortable for them as well. So if you could get in some sort of conversational flow, it's good for them, it's good for you, right? And you get then you get to see also how you're gonna work with this person rather than this interrogation where I get to know nothing about my interviewer. I get nothing to know about their values or anything else. Um, and so uh, you, you kind of change, reset the table as, as an interviewee. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, good question. Thank you. So I got another one question in the chat, which is explain what's in it for your network contact uh, and why are they willing to help? Okay, a couple answers to that. One, what's in it for them is being listened to. How many people get listened to these days, right? And so you you uh, hit me up and say, I'd really love to hear how you got there and your stories and experience and what, you know, what, what made you successful. Suddenly, you got somebody who wants to hear you, right? So you give the gift of listening. Um, and that is so rare that in this day and age. And if you've worked in corporate, you probably, you know, are trying to get your word in edgewise. Uh, and here you got a person who wants your, your experience, and your know-how and your expertise, um, and they're willing to listen, right? So that's number one. Number two, I think I mentioned during the call that there is just one thing that I've heard all my clients, thousand clients say in common, it's like, I like to help other people. So deep down, there is for most people uh, a willingness and a desire to help one another. And I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are, but where we come from, where we go back to is the same place. And we're on that journey together, right? Uh, and when you realize that uh, and you talk to person, to somebody who's aware of that, then they're going to be willing to help you. Are there people who are jerks and just, you know, feel like they're more important and don't have the time? Absolutely. Um, but we're not looking for those people. We're looking for the people who believe in karma, who believe in paying it forward, who believe in helping other people. And they're out there, right? Uh, I know I'm one of them. So you call me up and say, hey, Mark, can you tell me more about how you got in coaching uh, and how you know you made your first dollar and all that stuff? I'd say, the first thing I'd say actually is, are you trying to sell me anything? <laughs> and they said, no. Then I give them the time of day, you know, and I give them my, my information and so forth. And usually it doesn't happen often, but when it has, you know, we've gone beyond the five minutes they requested. And I stay on the phone for as long as I need because I feel like I'm helping somebody. Okay, next question. Uh, <laughs> hey, Dea. Uh, do I offer a refresher package? Yes, uh, I do have alumni rates for people I've worked with. Just contact me outside and we'll, we'll work on that. Ha absolutely. Um, anybody I've worked with before, we've done the heavy lifting. So then I give them the alumni rate and we just do one-off sessions. Absolutely available. Um, okay, how would you transition? How would you structure a transition um, into full-time freelancing? Uh, first thing I do is I, I was just working with a guy on this yesterday, um, is to determine what sector you want to serve, what problem, what urgent problem do you want to solve and for who? Um, and then what I do is I go out and I join uh, some networking groups that have these people understand the words they're using or implement what I call an ask campaign. You find other people uh, who, who have the problem that you solve and just ask them, so what's your problem? How's it, you know, how's it affecting you? you know, what, what? And, and you ask these questions. Um, and it's not hard to, to ask these things and you could give something in return for their time. You know, they're happy to give you a LinkedIn referral or, you know, send the results of my, my, uh, my study or whatever else like that. Um, but basically, I'm going to define the problem that I want to solve. 
I'm going to go find out how people talk about it in that target group. And then I'm going to create a data sheet, one front, one page front and back. The first is going to be, here's the, the challenges that uh, I, I'm, I'm working on, or I can help you solve. Here's the solutions, here's the benefits, and here's why me, right? Those four things are what people need to, to know. Um, and so basically now you have a piece of collateral that you can give. Uh, the other thing I want to do is develop questions so that when I go network, I can see whether those people have the, the problem that I solve, right? So I'm in relevant networking groups or talking to people and so forth, what questions are you going to ask so that you know that you have the solution to their problems? Or maybe they don't have it, but that one of their colleagues or, or somebody they know has the problem that you solve. And so you want to uh, create these questions so that you can get to that quickly. And, and anybody who's asking the questions guides the conversation, right? That's the person who's in control of the conversation. So get those questions together. Um, and then basically, again, find out what how these people are describing their problems. Use all that, synthesize that, create a data sheet, um, and then uh, do some pro bono work to get some testimonials. Just do a few hours of work for people so in return for give them giving you testimonials because testimonials are like gold. Get them on LinkedIn, get them on Yelp, get them on Google. Um, have them put it in three different places. Um, and now suddenly you have credibility, right? So there's this, these steps of processes that I would go through to, to go out. And I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs on getting them from the corporate world out. Um, and if you want to talk more about that, hit me up on the side. <laughs> hey, Mark, uh, yes. this is Rachel here. What is the role of the portfolio in the current market right now? The role of the, port I don't understand your question. I'm sorry. Uh, so the portfolio, it's usually for more marketing um, type roles. But oh, you mean your personal to... portfolio? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Um, obviously, always to demonstrate, it's, it's basically, you know, show me, don't tell me. Uh, I'm working with another guy right now. He's got a beautiful portfolio. Problem is, it doesn't tell me what the challenge was, what the solution was, and what the benefit was. What I want to see um, from a hiring manager perspective is, okay, yeah, you did this great work. How did it help? You know, what was the result? So if you could put just the, those words around it, it helps a lot. Um, and you know, you, certain, yes, for marketing, you're gonna have to have something like that, but you can have it for other uh, positions as well. And a lot of people just put together who they are, their backgrounds, uh, things that they've accomplished and so forth. So I find that it is a good piece of collateral as well. And again, something other people aren't doing. I don't know if that answered your question. Do you have anything more specific? <laughs> A little bit, yeah. So I'm in the executive admin field and, you know, providing work samples is very difficult considering yeah. the confidential nature of it. So right. I'm trying to work around that. Yeah, that is difficult. Um, you can replicate it um, and just, you know, either sanitize or replicate just so that, you know, it masks all of that information. So you're not in any breach of NDA or anything else like that or proprietary information. Or, you know, um, like I said, sanitize or replicate and just do it and say client A or whatever else like that, or customer A or whatever, um, and then uh, you know change the names of the innocent. Okay, yeah. What do you think about putting more um, personal information like like about your personality, who you are in a portfolio or, or even interview? Like, do, do, does that matter at all with the people that you're interviewing for? <clears throat> so I captured that in the professional dossier. So if you wanna put that on a portfolio, you can, right? And that's who am I, what I do, how I solve problems, my core competencies. I love it because it really tells me more about you as a person. It goes above and beyond what the competition does. And I get a whole more holistic view of who you are. So if you have a page, on a website, that'd be great. Or like I said, you could create a professional dossier, a one pager that you can send in along with a cover letter and you identify what this is in the cover letter. So they go, what is this? Uh, and you say, this just adds more color to who I am with the problems like I can help you solve and what I can do for you um, and use it as an attachment. Very cool. Okay, thank you, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, so we're a little over time. Uh, thank you so much again for, for, for joining me. And I will send you guys this, uh, this blueprints on the 10 steps. And if you have any other questions, you can reach out me, to me at uh, any of these places or I am at, uh, just go to www.csynergy.com and there's a place to contact me there. So again, thanks again for joining me. And I hope this was valuable for everybody. Thanks.